Hello and welcome back. Today we will be doing a react video to Richard Dawkins, this gentleman here, uh, discussing the evolution of the eye. I said before we were going to do kind of the last of the four horsemen, as it were, uh, Daniel Dennett, uh, Richard Dawkins, the man here, uh, Christopher Hitchens, and Sam Harris. And uh, this is one of my favorite videos of his. It's been quite a long time since I've seen it, or not videos as much as explanations, because he really details how the eye evolved over time. And it's just kind of uh, incredible uh, how that works and um, I think that evolution in particular is a, a good metaphor for how just improvement in general works which is that it's an iterative process and you know you you go you see what works uh, you take what works you continue on with it and you know there's an evolution uh, of processes and so I think it's a good metaphor for how one should look at improving which is you make mistakes you improve and this sort of thing and so let's get into him discussing how the eye evolved uh, I believe it's in the context of a debate uh, as well. Welcome to Revelation TV Studios. Okay. Uh, we are live. We didn't intend to go live, but uh, we're going to do that. And it reminds me really of when I first went live eight years ago on Revelation TV's first broadcast, and my heart is pounding. So, but nevertheless, it's a very. Following 9-11, you know, these four horsemen debated a lot uh, in terms of an anti-theist position, uh, which is not quite the position uh, I quite hold, although I think Dawkins was generally the most reserved uh, in terms of, uh, you know, his uh, denouncing of religion specifically, uh, and I think his primary concern was that of biology, and specifically education in schools uh, should conform with, uh, you know, uh, this sort of evolutionary teaching, which is, you know, empirically um, what what he believed to be the most supportive one. Very special day for me, and I'd like to warn you. So he debates a lot of theists. Special guest, Richard Dawkins. Richard, Darwin seemed to express that the evolution of the eye was a hard case to explain, says the, e the person who emailed this into me, Steve, I think it was. Do you have any cases yourself where there is uneasiness with this? Well, that's a famous quote from Darwin. Darwin said something like, to, to suppose that the eye, with all its intricate contrivances, he goes on a little, great detail about how complicated and, and beautiful the eye is, um, could, be, could, could come about as a result of, of evolution by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the... Yeah, the, so, like, one of the things is, like, the eye seems like this bridge sort of thing where, you know, something roughly approximating an eye doesn't quite seem useful at all, uh, and an eye is obviously very useful, and how do you get from no eye to eye, uh, you know, in terms of uh, a certain, uh, you know, stepping stone in that, uh, towards that direction actually being useful? The high is to be words to that effect. That quotation is very often given, but it, it isn't followed by what Darwin next said, which was to spend um, a, a good part of a chapter explaining exactly why actually it is explicable. And it's a there very, it's a, it's a, in a way, it's a good rhetorical technique to, as it were, offer something to your opponents um, before you then dis disillusion them. It, where it fails is if your opponents then take the offer and then don't quote what follows. This is, uh, you know, obviously this happens a lot where context is removed uh, whenever a position is attacked uh, and, you know, Dawkins is right to point it out, paying attention to, you know, what <laughs> what uh, the, the gentleman actually said. So, um, the, so the eye is actually uh, very well explicable by evolution and I've explained it in especially two of my books the blind watchmaker and climbing the mountain probable. Um, but that wasn't the question you asked me. You asked me the question, is there anything that I find particularly difficult? No. Um, <laughs> because Dawkins that's can be not the way science times. works. We don't say this is a very difficult case, therefore God must have done it. Therefore science can't explain it. Therefore the supernatural must be wheeled in to explain it. That isn't the way we work. If science can't explain it, then we say, all right then, let's go to work. Let's see what we need to do, what new theories we need to bring into our science, how we need to change our science. I think that, um, you know, for whenever anyone's looking for evidence of anything, uh, something that often needs to be like keenly paid attention to is confirmation bias. And this is like, uh, not saying religion specifically, but, uh, you know, just within any context, whatever your current worldview position is, you will have a tendency or bias to uh, just find information that supports that narrative instead of necessarily 
interpreting the information in the most generous and robust ways and this is to some extent unavoidable but you could run you know any sort of interpretation of reality through a series of questions in terms of a methodology uh, such that you're less likely to make this error um, you know uh, there's a uh, I can't remember the argument let's continue um, and uh, that technique has always worked so far if there was something that I was genuinely puzzled about, then my response would not be, oh, it must be supernatural. My response would be, then in that case, we must roll our sleeves up and go to work to try to understand it. Well, because to me, this is, apart from the person who emailed us in, this is really, and I put it at the top of my list, because it's something that bothered me when I was growing up, that I, I thought, how could we have evolved? Because the eye is so complex, for example, We've got cameras in this. This is probably going to go along the lines of like the classic watchmaker argument where, you know, uh, you discover a watch on the, uh, the watch is just so complex, it had to have been created by somebody. And then, uh, you know, if you discover a watch on the beach, uh, to say that it evolved there through uh, like some sort of evolutionary means is kind of silly. Um, and then it, someone must have designed it. And then to go, you know, a step further, you know, analogous thinking, uh, humans are so complex, someone clearly must have designed them studio here and they need camera operators to, to pull focus and to be able to change shots and everything and, and the more distance or close-up you get you have to change uh, the, the actual iris of the of the camera perhaps even open it or close it a little bit so yep. the, that's Optics. all done instantaneously within from the within the brain the human brain and it's so complex that I thought yeah how could we have been bumping around without sight for thousands or millions of years if we've evolved when really it needed to be functioning from the word go. So this is like a very uh, important kind of uh, question to ask is how do you, you know, get from no sight to sight? Because obviously sight's advantageous once you have it, but there's a there's a vast like bridge to be to, to be crossed and Dawkins of course is gonna get into it. Well, yes, all right, I, I will answer that, that question. Um, certainly, you're absolutely right. The eye is a most remarkable organ, and it does the same sorts of things that these television cameras do. It does um, instant focusing. It does instant stopping down with the iris diaphragm. It's, it's got um, full color, three, three color vision, just like modern televisions have. Um, and it is a remarkably beautiful, it's not totally flawless. There are interesting flaws, interesting imperfections, which actually yeah. are where the revealing. optic nerve connects. Nevertheless, it does work There's very a... well, and an engineer would um, give it somewhat high marks for being well, quote, designed. Now, you raise the question, doesn't it all have to be working before it'll work, before it'll, it's any, any good? How could we bump along for millions of and years? And this is the critical question. Only half an eye. That's a bit of a fallacy, because actually, um, only a quarter of an eye, only a hundredth of an eye, is better than nothing. You can make a, s a slowly climbing ramp of improvement from just the very rudiments of vision, just say being able to tell the difference between light and shade, nothing more than that, right up to the perfection of a human eye or the eye of a hawk, say. And in order for evolution to explain that, all, all we need is that there should be a, a ramp of improvement where every step, a hundredth of an eye, two hundredths of an eye, three hundredths of an eye, etc. Fifty percent of an eye, fifty-one percent of an eye. Each step has got to be an improvement on the one that went before. And so this is, uh, you know, this is the difficult task. Uh, if you're not very familiar with the argument is like, how do you say, well, what would, what would just a slight, he mentioned shade and it's like, you ask yourself, well, how would shade be useful? This type of thing. But in terms of like, uh, you know, practice for engaging in self-improvement in general, uh, you know, I think that this, uh, the, I, the, the metaphor of evolution that you can use where you're trying to make tiny little improvements is a really useful one. Uh, yeah, let's continue. And it's easy to see why that would be. You start by being able to tell whether there's a shadow, whether it's night or day. Yep. Shadow's useful, it could be a predator moving overhead in the... That example that a shadow can indicate a predator being overhead, it was like the wildest like click the first time I heard this, um, you know, in terms of usefulness. See, um, night or day is obviously useful for all sorts of purposes. Then you could imagine 
a cup. Um, instead of just having a flat sheet of light sensitive cells, it just, the edges turn up into a cup. Now the cup means that if there's light coming from that direction, it hits that part of the eye. If there's light coming from that direction, it hits that part of the eye. So already the animal can tell the direction from there which light go. is coming and the direction from which a shadow is coming. And so one we step. haven't got an image yet, all we've got is the direction of light. Now the cup can steadily and slowly over evolutionary time close over until you end up with a little hole at the top. And the little hole at the top, the same principles working all the way, that light coming from that direction hits that part of the retina and from that direction hits this part of the retina. But because there's a hole, it's rather more precisely, not exactly focused, but um, light from there hits there, light from there hits there, light from there hits there because it's got to get through the hole. When so the greater the curvature, the more finite or fine-tuned your ability to perceive where it's coming from is. And you can see that this is like the, the, the critical thing is you can, there's a very slow and steady progress from just being able to see light to being able to determine direction to, you know, having a fine-tuned thing. Uh, but in the case of the eye specifically, if I'm not mistaken, if you were to design an eye from scratch, uh, and Dawkins might even make this point later, putting the blind spot in, like, where the optic nerve connects in the back of the eye, and putting the blind spot in, like, the, the central, like, area of focus of the eye just seems like a wild uh, sort of mistake to make because where the optic nerve comes in, light cannot reflect there, and instead, your brain actually fills in all of the gaps it, um, you know, it creates uh, a field of vision rather than having this blank spot. Uh, and the fact that your brain can, uh, you know, you can look up uh, optic nerve, uh, like, illusion or this type of thing, uh, and you will be able to find a thing where you can see how your brain will autocomplete. Uh, and it is actually very interesting how almost all of our perception is auto-completed kind of uh, by our brain or the image that we get is actually not that fine-tuned an image and instead our brain is doing a lot of uh, interpretive elements which is why uh, you know stuff like uh, the the uh, illusions and like this type of thing I forget what they're called um, you know the illusions where things will look here let's pull one up in just a second so this is one of the more common examples of an optical illusion where oop uh, one moment right here, where we have, you know, uh, these two lines are actually the exact same length, uh, but because of, you know, how your brain is used to auto-completing information, let's say, uh, the line that has the open ends is going to look quite a bit longer than the other one. You know, this is another example where your brain is trying to complete things, and these lines are actually all parallel to each other, the left-right lines. But as a result of, you know, the offsetting of the white and black squares, uh, they look like they're actually not doing this and this is your brain is trying to make sense of this you know it's the the cafe wall illusion i guess it is what it's called here and this is like they're parallel they look not parallel though as a result of how your brain is trying to make sense of the information and they might even wiggle back and forth so let's come back into this moving towards a pinhole camera now a pinhole camera if you make the hole small enough and remember we're having a smooth gradient of closing up the hole. If you make the hole small enough, then it makes a sharp, focused image. The trouble with a pinhole yep. camera is that the image is very dim because very little light can get through the pinhole. What you need is a lens um, because what a lens does is gather light from different directions and focus it on a point. Instead of ha it having to go right through the middle of the hole, it could be gathered from a wider range of sources. Now, so now we're introducing a, like another element, the lens in addition to just having, you know, the, the portion of the eye where the light is reflected on, and so now, how does the lens come uh, about? Um, a lens is not difficult to arrange. Any old chunk of set of transparent gubbins will do the job better than <laughs> a pinhole. So once again, we've got a slow, gradual improvement. Any old lump of gubbins, transparent, is better than nothing, and then the lens simply improves its shape gradually, 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 gradually. It's got to be gradually. Every step has got to be a slight improvement over the previous one. You get a lens. Um, Can I just ask you though, Richard? Yes. Uh, how long did this process take? Well, that's very interesting. I mean, we, we've got 
um, hundreds of millions of years to play with because that's what geological time gives us. And I believe that Dawkins will talk about how it's evolved multiple times uh, throughout history, the, the creation of an eye. We've got maybe a billion years since the first eye, since the first focusing eye appeared. Um, what about the trilobite? Trilobites uh, uh, have very beautiful eyes. Um, and very, very clever. I mean, they're just, it's amazing. Uh, they, 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 have, they have compound eyes, which is what modern insects and crustaceans have. But and the trilobite has, um, in, in the fossil record, is exactly the same today as it was, or in that sense. It, it, it didn't evolve, it had, it, it well, had those lenses. Well, there are today. No, I mean, but um, it had the lens uh, mechanism, which is, is no, quite trilob powerful. Well, tri trilobites have... So his argument, of course, is that the trilobites' eyes have been the same for so long. Uh, obviously, there's not any sort of evolution occurring. Have, co have compound eyes, which is a very different principle and a very interesting principle. It's, it doesn't uh, focus quite as, um, as sharp an image as our eyes do, um, but it is a very beautiful thing. Um, and trilobites do go back um, hundreds of millions of years, 500 million years, half a billion years. Um, it must have taken um, some time before trilobites came on the scene, but even trilobites are relatively recent compared to the age of the Earth, which is four and a half billion years old. Um, um, but obviously, of course, uh, as a creationist or believer in creation, the book is... Yeah, it's important to recognize that this entire video and also Dawkins' explanation is from the context of he's on a religious show and he's here to uh, be challenged by this guy. Uh, and so, and Dawkins is, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, the four horsemen go, uh, he is, uh, generally speaking, the uh, most willing to be patient with positions that he strongly disagrees with. Genesis. You know, I would disagree with that. But uh, yeah. what would you disagree with? With the the time. The oh, time how old do you think the world is then? I would say that, uh, as because I'm a Bible believing yes. Christian, that I believe that the Book of Genesis is an is an actual fact, uh, the the record, because Christ as well referred often to the Book of Genesis. That in the beginning, yes, yes, uh, Adam and Eve, and I know that. Mm. But before we get onto that because we can come back to that, mm, right. is that there is um, an email that came in with regards to the eye, which I, I'd like to, to read because yes. it's, uh, it's quite intelligently written. Uh, in Richard's book, The Greatest Show on Earth, uh, and he gives the pages, etc., he claims the retina could not have been designed as creationists say because the... Fo I think this is the point I had made earlier. ...photoreceptors are at the back rather than the front so it is back to front and it was a fact he said if it was created it was the design of an idiot <laughs> just stop there uh, recent research has shown that there are cells in the retina that guide light to the photoreceptors and refocus it the scientists who did this research described the light guiding cells in the retina structure with the words optimal design for improving the sharpness of images and that's from physical review letters etc etc um, will Richard admit he is wrong since he is not an expert on optics and the researchers are? I believe he's actually done a decent amount. He, I mean, he's talked about the, the creation of the eye quite a lot, but the objection here is, or Richard's, you know, objection in his book, is that uh, if you were to design an eye from scratch, uh, you would not design it in such a way. However, if you are going to design an eye, or if an eye is going to appear over, you know, you have a flat disc that sees light and then it begins curving and this sort of thing, you know, if you are going to create an iterative story of how an eye is created, it in fact makes an incredible amount of sense that the eye is the way it is. Well, no, I will not admit I'm wrong. Um, this is a very interesting case. Um, the, the, the retina is back to front. Um, the retina of the vertebrate eye is back to front in the sense that the light sensitive cells are pointing away from the light. Now, uh, the light sensitive cells are connected to the brain via nerves, and any sensible designer would have had the nerves behind the light sensitive cells, which is in fact the way they are in mollusks, for example, octopuses, which have rather good eyes, rather like ours, with a different. Right, you don't want to have the optical nerve uh, blocking any space for receptors, which is what we currently have, which is why we have blind spots. The difference being that the light sensitive cells point towards the light and the wires connecting it to the brain lead backwards to the brain, which is the sensible way to do it. Now, the vertebrate eye is back to front so that the wires that connect the light sensitive cells to the brain are running along the front of the retina. That means that the light has to penetrate the, this forest of wires, nerves, before it hits the light-sensitive cells which are facing backwards. 
Now, I've forgotten about this. this. Happened. It happened for historical reasons, and there's, there's no, no doubt about that. Now, it, it is of course true that humans, for example, and I mentioned hawks before, see much better than octopuses. So in spite of the fact that our eye has this design flaw, we have better eyes because natural selection comes along afterwards and cleans up after the original mess that was made by this fundamental design flaw. Natural selection came along afterwards and made all sorts of little titivations which have the effect of giving us really rather good vision. And that happens again and again. It's very interesting that you get a, 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 a bungle to begin with. And then rather than correct the bungle, what natural selection does is to come along and make little titivations, little tinkerings, which sort of make, make up for the, for the mistake. And that's a very in interesting um, phenomenon. Also, if something stops being useful, like, for example, humans have a tailbone still uh, that doesn't provide any sort of use because we don't have tails for balance anymore. Uh, but, you know, this erases or gets uh, overwritten uh, over a long period of time because it's not that big uh, a maladaption. Um, and also, you know, as he is saying, uh, you know, it, the, the, it is an iterative process. It builds on whatever was came before it. And if that thing has an error, you just build on top of the error and you make an improvement from the perspective of error, which you would not do if there was a really loud car outside. What you would instead do is, you know, if you were designing something from scratch, you would, of course, not make the error to begin with in the case of the eye, back to having to the, go through the bundles. The timing yes. uh, of when do you, you say that we uh, reached our optimum where we're at today, uh, how far back would you have to go? Ten? Oh, I, I, I wouldn't use the word like or? optimum. I mean, I, what, I think... Well, what because I, you think we're still evolving, obviously. Well, but where we're at today? What, well, what, uh, what I'd prefer to say is that um, natural select... Oh, is that it? We'll see if we can find a slightly an extension of this, maybe. Okay, we found a longer one that doesn't just have the eye clip, although we are kind of running out of uh, the realm of talking about the eye and entering oh, I, I, the I bigger domain. Yeah, like I mean, uh, what, I think well, what because I, you think we're still evolving, obviously, well, but where we're at today. What, well, what, uh, what I'd prefer to say is that um, natural selection is constantly working and, is, and the environment is constantly changing, um, if only because the, the predators, the enemies, the parasites uh, of any particular species are also evolving. And so you never really reach a sort of finished, settled optimum. Um, there's always more improvement that, that, that can happen. This is uh, actually an interesting, uh, there's a book on evolution called, I believe, The Red Queen, uh, which the metaphor is talking about, the metaphor of the title is talking about Alice in Wonderland, um, where, you know, Alice, in order to get away from the cards that are chasing her, she runs as fast as she can, but she stays in the same place. And the same, uh, the metaphor in terms of talking about evolution is that, you know, uh, you are evolving faster and faster and faster, but the, the predators around you, you know, evolve at the same pace. And so you really just kind of stay at a even level of fitness here let's get a picture of Dawkins parts of the body which to me I mean as I say just as a layman um, I had to come to terms with you know how on earth did we function and uh, the heart for example the lungs the liver the kidneys uh, and I don't think this is necessarily like a that fair line of inquiry because he just talked about the eye which was the challenge that was presented to him but now we have a little bit of Dawkins on screen but the the idea behind the the red queen metaphor is you know you're you're engaged in a process of improvement that ends up putting you in the same place because what uh, the environment is uh changing around you and then also any sort of predators and this type of thing are also uh you know improving alongside you but I think that, uh, you know, the this discussion of the creation of the eye is particularly interesting to me because, you know, I think that it is something that is hard to uh, sort of put in your head or like if you're if you first when you first hear about evolution, uh, the example of something like an eye uh, seems to be the case of something that, you know, would it be hard to how would you get a sort of successive iteration? You can't just have an eyeball out of nothing. And what would be the base level thing? And I find, you know, the Dawkins one particularly, uh, this is one of, like, my favorite uh, of his explanations because it's just so 
incredible how, you know, you can start with just, just being able to sense light, uh, you know, being able to sense a predator overhead if you're in the ocean is particularly useful, um, being able to, you know, uh, know if it's daytime or nighttime this is sort of useful thing and then you add directionality and you add all this other stuff in and then the you know the you go from a flat sort of thing to getting a curved and then eventually it's tiny closure but then also what's particularly i i think um striking is that it's also inefficient because of where the nerves are located and the light has to go through the nerves and you would not design it in this way if you were engaged in a design um which of course is dawkins's principal argument i believe that's why he uses the eye as an example because it is uh if you are looking for an example of something that really doesn't look designed and looks evolved um you know the eye is the strong example because it if it were designed it would be designed inefficiently. Uh, but I, I think that as a communicator, I'm just uh, generally kind of, uh, you know, a slight fan of Dawkins. I'm not, I haven't deep dove his work, uh, but I have read, uh, I think, a couple of his books. Um, and uh, as a science communicator, which is what he aims to do, he was primarily concerned, uh, he's not active now, I think he's still alive. Um, he was primarily concerned with, you know, uh, how things were being taught in schools in regards to evolution, which is why he went on a lot of these debates. But but as you can see, he was also incredibly civil with the with the gentleman he was discussing. Um, you know, there are some times where you could tell that he uh, thought the guy was really wrong, but uh, didn't really go after him in any sort of uh, way. Um, but I just wanted to do a video on Dawkins, um, you know, uh, and we will be trying to do a little bit higher frequency here as well. Uh, you know, I I hadn't been posting for a while. Uh, I said that uh, I would do a react to Dawkins. This is kind of one of the easier ones, and I think uh, one of the less perhaps inflammatory ones. I don't really want to um, necessarily go on like an atheist, down an atheist sort of uh, rabbit hole with my content because generally speaking I think that um, the subject of religion is not that productive a one to talk about in any in either capacity because you know if you if you are a believer you're not going to convince non-believers and if you're a non-believer you're not going to convince believers and it's generally not a productive area for discourse but I did want to uh, you know sort of round out the crew because that started with really doing a lot of Hitchens um, you know talking about uh, stuff not related to religion i don't think I, we've reviewed any of hitchens religious material maybe no we had with the te hitchens is ten commandments but um that's okay he generally thought the commandments were good uh and then you know we looked at sam harris on free will and then you know might as well kind of round out the i wanted to see da daniel dennett on free will and then you know this is kind of uh closing the gap here anyways i hope you guys enjoyed if you did feel free to like comment subscribe you know do the youtube algorithm thing and have a good day